four million people alive today because of life-saving treatments. And literally billions have been protected because of how the world responded. But funding is down, stigma is still there, discrimination also. AIDS as a new story has really dropped off the headlines. In this fourth decade, what worries you the most? Well, I think, as you pointed out, I think we uh, have come very far. I think we have now 8 million people in antiretroviral treatment. I think that's huge, considering the fact that that has not been the case before. I think uh, we are still seeing a lot of very important countries like China and South Africa very involved now. I think we are seeing major changes in how the developing countries themselves are taking response for their own and paying for their own a response to the epidemic, but I also we see the flattening out of uh, international funding and that we can't let that happen because we really are at a turning point at the moment and I think it's very crucial that we won't harness the gains that we could so easily gain uh, unless we manage to keep the funding up internationally. Of course, we're speaking in Washington. The District of Columbia, the American capital, has more HIV infections than some countries in Africa. What do people still need to understand about AIDS 31 years on? I think one thing that is crucial to understand that the stigma and discrimination that people living with AIDS face wherever they are in the world are still enormous. And I think that is uh, something we cannot, we can never stop talking about because it's such a crucial, uh, uh, so such a crucial issue for all those people who are living with AIDS. And, they have to live with it. I can sit and talk about it, but they have to live with it in their everyday lives. When they go to the shop, when they go to the doctor, when they go to the dentist, when they talk to their families, when they have all the interactions they have, they face the stigma and discrimination that uh, I think is, uh, it moves me. And I think uh, having the experience of working as a volunteer at a community center in Oslo also brings that much closer to my life and wanting to raise that issue uh, every time I talk about this. Have you ever thought about if it was your own son, your, either of your sons or your daughter, if they became infected, how would, how would it impact you? Obviously that would make a huge change in our lives and obviously I hope my children don't have to go through that. But I think it is something that we really need to put in that perspective to really understand what it would feel like. So I think it's a very important question that you raise because I think that's at the core of it, because I think that's why it's so also so hard to talk about HIV and AIDS in a lot of uh, the settings that we do, because it's so much affecting what it is to be a human being. I don't like numbers, but I'm going to give you numbers, and yes. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. It's two and a half million new HIV infections every year, and to put that into context, that's mm. exactly half the entire population of Norway, half of your country, where mm. are we going wrong? Well, I think first of all, as that we are often not targeting the key populations, like men who have sex with men or um, sex workers, injecting drug users. I think in a lot of uh, countries, these groups are so hard to talk about and so hard to interact with for many, uh, for many uh, people working in the response that um, I think we often lack uh, our ability to target those populations who need it the most and who will drive, be the drivers of the epidemic in each of the country. So I think that's one of the reasons. Your Royal Highness, we wish you every happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, James. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you.